Artificial intelligence is sort of everywhere at the moment. And so in terms of applications that affect our daily lives, anything from hopping onto a search engine and using Google, for example, through to using your smartphone to navigate around the city, through to going and buying something for your mom on Mother's Day, all of that will involve you using artificial intelligence to, to some extent. Um, so there are a number of applications in your everyday life that uses artificial intelligence. I think above and beyond that, there are also things that we don't see that use artificial intelligence all the time. So you use artificial intelligence to do weather monitoring so you can deliver your weather reports to you. We use artificial intelligence to uh, do things for national security so that our nations are secure and that we uh, can conduct foreign policy and diplomacy in ways that are sound and our politics are stable. So there are a number of ways behind the scenes as well as in our physical hands that you see artificial intelligence used all the time. Artificial intelligence, I think, will really transform the way in which we do politics and governance and government. Um, I think there are also some things that it won't change. So I think it's important to bear in mind that there are some things that are novel and some things that are not novel. I think things that artificial intelligence will change about governments is that it can enable a number of different uh, ways of providing information and synthesizing information from your voter populace. So that's a positive effect in that you can use artificial intelligence in smart ways to better aggregate preferences across your voter ship uh, and so then you can use that in, in ways that will better inform policy. I think in the more negative sense artificial intelligence can also affect governments and government institutions um, by uh, the proliferation of various things like deep fakes or, or synthetic media um, which can in various ways undermine the way in which politics works in various countries. I think you can also expect artificial intelligence to be used by authoritarian governments in ways that are plausible not great um, for the population uh, that they apply it to. Um, but then I also think that artificial intelligence, as with a number of other technologies that we've tried to govern and regulate in the past, um, there won't be a huge amount of difference in terms of the kinds of things that we want to do. We want to make technologies safe. When you deploy them, you want to control the way that they're used. You want to regulate the bounds by which users um, can be sort of pushed or nudged by various companies that are selling these technologies to users. And these are challenges that we face in the past when we have technologies come out and emerge uh, and deliver new applications as well. So I think there are some things that artificial intelligence will challenge and there are also some things where artificial intelligence will bring up the same challenges and we have to keep grappling with the same challenges in terms of government and governance. Artificial intelligence, I think, is going to challenge a lot of how governments relate to big technology firms. Um, and there are a number of reasons why that's the case. I think, firstly, we have to recognize that companies are the ones producing these technologies um, and governments are not capable of producing these technologies in-house. I think we also need to recognize that governments have a very strong desire to control and influence the way in this technology is being shaped um, because they need to do so for protection of national security and also for pursuing leadership on the international stage. And I think you also need to recognize that companies today, perhaps more so than ever, are large, are significantly powerful, um, and are in many ways threatening the way in which governments can control their actions. And so um, there's a lot of tensions, I think, that can emerge between governments and firms when they're trying to both control and influence the technology that they're both very actively interested in pursuing. I think there are also ways in which firms and governments can cooperate in new ways and you see this happening all the time when for example firms will cooperate with governments to make sure that this technology is being used um, and deployed in a somewhat safe and robust way. Um, the other party that I think is important are the, the research communities that are driving these forward. And researchers are both in academic institutions and universities, but more so now, universities are not the primary employers of researchers. I think researchers are more uh, employees of, of companies. And so I think these communities often will be the core drivers of principles and norms about safety and ethics. Um, and I think their relationship with their companies is very important in that they can promote these kind of agendas within their companies and really speak uh, for the, the values of safety and robustness such that their companies can then develop those technologies and deploy them responsibly as well. So I think there are a lot of different relationships that, that are interesting, can be challenged, but that can also be opportunities for seeding cooperation and seeding uh, good norms to proliferate when we develop these technologies in the future.